Good afternoon. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I'm Armand Limnander, the deputy editor of W Magazine in New York. And we're very lucky this afternoon for the fashion section of the festival to have Pamela Gauvin, the curator of the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris, one of the most important fashion museums and institutions in the world, and Gokash Kanasi, the designer and owner of Vionnet, one of the most important labels in the history of women's fashion. So it's, um, it's quite a, a, a panel that we have. Um, I wanted to start by um, asking Goga to just introduce yourself and tell us how you came into the fashion world, because it's a little bit of an unusual path. You're not the, the typical fashion designer. Can the you tell us a little? The day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, actually, it's always been my my passion and uh, my ambition to to be in fashion. However, destiny takes you different um, ways, and um, eventually, so I suppose, when you are meant to be doing something, you will arrive there. So I've finally feel at the final destination. However, I was born um, in um, a communist country. Actually, I was born in Russia. Um, and then I was educated in England, and when I wanted to go to St. Martin's, my parents said, please get an education first, and then <laughs> uh, if you need to be creative, you can always take that up at a later stage, which um, then didn't happen immediately, unfortunately, or fortunately. I'm not complaining, of course, uh, and every experience is an experience. However, I ended up being in finance and in um, oil and gas, and mining industries among a bunch of others. And then eventually, I always felt that I couldn't, that fashion was something I couldn't live without. So if, if, if any advice I would ever give to anyone with, with, the, with the experience that I'm, that I'm having today is if, if, if one does, is not completely passionate about about fashion and the processes involved. One shouldn't go into the fashion <laughs> industry. Uh, however, I'm extremely lucky and uh, extremely, I feel, I feel very honored to be able to uh, participate to the legacy and, and, and I suppose also contribute uh, a little uh, of my own legacy into a brand like Vionnet because uh, of course Vionnet, I don't know how many of you are familiar because it's it's quite staggering for me actually that there's a lot of people that have not heard of of the brand and uh, of the name Madeleine Vionnet who in fact probably has um, created fashion as we know it today it's it's probably the for me of course I'm is the most influential character in in the fashion that we see and that is relevant in in today's um, uh, fashion shows and, and, yeah. and works of many. I think so. uh, I think we're very lucky that uh, we have Pamela with us because <laughs> Pamela curated an Absolutely. exhibition on Madeleine Vionnet before uh, Goga uh, came came on board at the brand. Uh, you came in 2012, Correct. and your in exhibition was 2009, 10. Correct, nine. Um, so <coughs> I think it would be interesting if Pamela gave us a little bit of the background on Vionnet based on her exhibition just really explain quite how significant the fashion legacy of Vionnet is and how, how it reverberates today. We're going we're gonna to try some technical feats. Hopefully, it'll work. So this is Madeleine Vionnet. Um, she looks more like a grandmother than an a revolutionary, uh, which is what she was. She was born at the end of the 19th century in 1876 and lived quite an incredible life because she passed away almost for her 100th birthday. But in the meantime, she did revolutionize fashion, as Goga said. We have very many passionate conversations about Madeleine. Um, on a personal level, I started my career working on Madeleine Vionnet, that was about 26 years ago. But on a professional level, she is one of the most important designers. So, is this going to work? Right. This was her um, salon, uh, 50 Avenue Montaigne, in the 8th in Paris. She actually opened her house in 1912. 
But what is it that she did? She's considered the purest of fashion. And she was a contemporary of Paul Poiré, who was much more considered a costume designer, as she actually called him, or Gabrielle Chanel, who started exactly the same year in 1912. The reason why her name is so, um, I guess, little known today, as opposed to someone like Chanel or Poiré, is because she decided to close her house in 1939. But before she did that, she established really the archetypal uh, modern wardrobe. She worked in, on a little doll, and this little doll is 80 centimeters high. And the reason why she did that was because all of her designs were based on three shapes, the square, the rectangle, and the circle. And basically, she was able to do the central of all of her work around these three basic shapes. She worked on, like a puzzle, these little shapes on the doll, so it's three-dimensional and not flat as things had been done just until then, because she really felt that it was about the body. Um, the body had no seams, and so that was why it was so important to use it on a small scale, and her ateliers then made it much bigger, scale one, so that she could really experiment. Oops. So this is actually from the Encyclopedia of Diderot in the 18th century, and this is a, how tailors worked, and worked up until the 19th century when Madeleine Vionnet began her own house. And it was basically just flat, two-dimensional. So you cut out the shapes from a, from a fabric, and then through seaming, you created a volume. But Vionnet was not about that, and she always said, the body has no seams, so why should dresses as well um, follow that? This is her masterpiece. This is the four handkerchief dress. It's basically four squares. But when you look at it today, it's very difficult to understand how revolutionary this piece was. There's no hooks, there's no buttons, there's no zippers, there's no lining. It's one size fits all. It's basically stretch for lycra. And women could dress themselves in 30 seconds flat. Before then, women actually needed someone to help them put all of the little buttons, hook it all up. It took probably about an hour to get dressed. So Madeleine Vionnet introduced what Steve Jobs did, the iPhone. No more buttons. This was it. Simplified <laughs> to the minimum. And for you to really understand how incredible this is, we have a little film. So these are the four panels of bias cut crepe marocain. Um, it's the kind of crepe that she used. She had many types of crepe. It was the weight that was very important for her. And so they're all on a di at diagonal, which is how you get that bias so that it stretches. But she didn't invent the bias. It was used before. But the reason why nobody had ever actually done a dress in it was because it was stealth wealth. To use the bias cut meant that you needed a lot more fabric. So obviously, it was much more expensive. And here it is, the 100-plus-year-old dress. I don't think it's taken a wrinkle until now. And this is something we've spoken a lot with Golda. Madeleine felt that she, her creations were very important. She didn't feel that she was an artist, and this is, I think, something that we'll also discuss um, with Hussein in, um, in the next panel, but is fashion an art? Madeleine Mune was very clear about that. She said, artists dream. Fashion designers need to dress women or men. If not, they close shop, and that's something that's very important within the fashion world. It is an industry, and Goga's business acumen has been very important in this whole um, uh, process. But what, um, one of the things that was very important to Madeleine was copyright infringement. We're in the 1920s. She's the first to actually write the laws against copyright infringement. So all of her labels 
carried her thumb, her digital imprint, to show this is my signature. This is what I've done. This is my creation. And so here, the first actual signature that she did in her first piece is in 1912. And then as of 1918, because of her success, she was copied in all of the Anglo-Saxon countries as well as in Europe. And she started printing her digital um, thumb on each of the, of the labels. And you see it um, on the, the ones that are below it. That was just a, a very small, quick look at Vioni before we, we continue our talk. So we're going to have, we're going to show now on a continuous loop in the back, the new Vioni, which is uh, what Goga has been doing for the past couple of years. And so why don't you um, tell us a little bit about what your, uh, what your vision is. This is the past, what the present and the future is for you. Well, I think, <coughs> With a, with a name like Vionnet coming into fashion is, is definitely a, an honorary task, but at the same time a very challenging task because whether you like it or not, you're going to be compared with someone who is a legend, someone whose shoes nobody, in, in, in my opinion, can, can fill. So... Um, Right now, I'm the creative director. However, I have a, uh, a beautiful and talented team that I, that I call my family that, is, that are all working together on, um, on the V&A today. And directing them is a pleasure. It's, 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 they are, it, it truly, we call, we call ourselves the V&A family. Um, and first and foremost, the first inspiration that we take is, is from Madeleine V&A and always trying to be true to the heritage and always join, trying to be true to the, um, to the DNA of the brand, let's say. However, as Pamela was explaining, and, and as you see from, uh, from her inventions, she has invented what has been claimed, let's say, by the fashion world. There isn't, I don't think, a designer today who's not using the bias cut, who's not using the draping, the, um, the pleating, the, all of the, the so-called language, let's say the language of fashion that, that, that we're using today, um, creating it. So it is a very challenging task to claim some of those signatures back and, and say, in fact, this is Vionnet. Of course, there's always fashion, as many other creative industries, are, is a very referential platform, let's say. There's a lot of references. Uh, people use and, and um, some use it literally and then others try to be more innovative, I think. And this is another component, I think, to, to uh, the vision that, uh, that I've got is she was an innovator and she was a revolutionary and to be revolutionary in a way is also preserving her legacy. Um, in today's... Um, environment, I think um, the textiles are very important. We're looking at the shapes because as you see the shapes, they, they seem almost simple, simplistic, but at the same time perfect. And um, so we're using, in fact, I've ordered myself the same 80 centimeter dolls without realize, realizing, of course, that she used 80 centimeter dolls because there was exactly half of an of a, uh, average height. Today, people are taller. <laughs> and before it was easier to then transfer it onto a big pattern by just times it by two. Now, of course, we have these 80 centimeter doors and we drape on them and then we have to <laughs> calculate <laughs> literally by decimal <coughs> points. But um, so we, we still take these shapes, these squares, the circle and um, working with, the, with, the, with these geometrical shapes, but using the new technology in a way uh, by using all of these new tools that are that are available to us. So the materials, the the textures, the um, the the new finishes are very much present, and and hopefully we're creating something that that will have a reference in the future. Something that was that was new. Of course, I haven't been um, doing this for for too long, and and. I have a great team, however, I'm also on the learning curve. I'm a, I, I also believe uh, for creativity, to nurture your creativity, you always have to remain curious and, 
and in a way always stay on that learning curve. But um, hopefully it's getting, it's getting better and, and hopefully um, it's getting or is worthy of, of, of such a beautiful name and such a tremendous heritage for, for a whole industry. So. Um, Madeleine Vionnet was also considered by many one of the, uh, a, a, a very early feminist, if not in, in, in her language, in her work. She, uh, she really, as Pamela was explaining, until she and others like Chanel and Schiavarelli came along, women were corseted, women were constrained by what they wore, and she liberated them from that. that was a, there was a lot of political elements in her work. Um, I was wondering whether you, coming from a part of, I mean, I know your, your, your family is originally from Kazakhstan. Do you feel that there's the need, do you feel a sen in, an, in any sense any feminist agenda in your work, considering that there are still parts of the world where women cannot express themselves freely through fashion? Have you, have you thought of that considering, you know, the housework that, it, it's, inter it, it's interesting for, to me that your interest was in Vionnet because there's so many other, other houses. Um, you said my origin is Kazakh, however, unfortunately, I've never properly lived there and I never, I guess, felt um, in any way constrained. Um, even when I work there, I think it's, I'm, I'm definitely, if not a lot, a bit feminist. <laughs> so if there are any correlations to be, um, to be brought uh, with with myself and and Vionnet and, and and Madeleine, I definitely I definitely believe in um, in women that are powerful, and I believe in in capabilities of women. I believe that our um, the potential of of women is not yet explored to the full. Um, I do believe that certain cultures, perhaps more than others, uh, contribute to that fact. Uh, however, I also believe in the power of the individual, and uh, I think that if this woman a hundred years ago, and that environment I think was a lot less um, women friendly, let's say, mm -hmm. if uh, more than a hundred years ago she was able to, to, to reach this far in today's world, what can any woman do? If you put your mind to it, if you put your willpower, if you put positive energy, if you keep your open mind, I think um, everything is possible. And I, I, I'm a big supporter of that belief and I'm a big supporter of women um, because I do believe that in a way they need help sometimes. However, always say it's all in your hands. It's it's all in it's it's all yours. Well, another interesting point is that fashion has become so global in the past 20, 30 years. I mean, when you think back at the time of Vionnet or even 30, 40 years ago, all fashion came from Italy and from France and then eventually from the United States. I don't think we would have had a uh, Russian designer at a major European fashion house even even 15, 20 years ago. So that in itself is a very, is a very positive, positive change. Do you think that fashion has the power nowadays, especially with all the advances in communications and visual language, to really affect cultural change? Well, I think there was a lot more exposure, let's say, of the population to the creative, maybe in some parts of the world, and, and, and it was more nurtured. Um, so I guess in today's world, I mean, again, I don't like any kind of definition or tagging. I'm of Kazakh origin. I've also got Jewish blood in me. I've also got Tatar blood in me, and, and I've been kind of brought up all over the world. And and I, that's contributed and and led me up to to where I am today. I I think in today's world of um, uh, increased communication and uh, information availability, there's definitely definitely more opportunities and more exposure even at a young age if you're interested if you feel the need to to read something about Vionnet you can with a click of a button today before you would probably have to travel um, for I don't know months to get to a library to, to read that book 
But not all the information is right. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> not all the information you read is... Apparently not, exactly. Just last <laughs> night we were checking... Uh, we were checking on the internet and... It was an article from 1976 from Soviet Union, in fact, and I mean... I always check my facts with Pamela because if there's anyone in the world <laughs> that is a true expert, um, so it, it's it's Pamela for instantaneous sure. Instantaneous translation. What we realize that. What are some of the misconceptions? There was pretty much 50% of that article was <laughs> not true. Um, so <laughs> it was it was really quite um, it was it was really quite interesting because I was reading the article first uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was thinking to myself. I thought I'd read quite a lot of literature now and really studied the Vionnet history quite intensely I, for, for a while. And I thought, my God, I didn't know that she invented a hoodie and that was <laughs> <laughs> written in the article. So I was asking Pamela, I said, well, I, just, I didn't want to step on anybody's um, foot here, you know, but I mean, it's good if she did, but it doesn't seem logical because you do remember those those beautiful capuchons on on these cloaks of uh, of ladies of uh, many centuries before, and and I asked, and, and Pamela said, I can guarantee she did not in the <laughs> <laughs> invent the hoodie. Perhaps uh, many many other things, but mm. definitely not a hoodie. Well, in fashion, it's always difficult to say who was the first. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you have to stay very. Um, I guess distant from that. There was a beautiful conversation between between Doucet and and Jacques Madeleine. Doucet. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, who was her first um, or one of the significant employers where she uh, where, where she created her first um, barefoot braless um, collection. Let's say, if I'm correct, do cut me off, please. Um, <laughs> and uh, that conversation was kind of interesting. And again, Pamela cut in and said. Go get that conversation never happen. I can <laughs> pretty much guarantee that. But it's nice to have imagination. Definitely. And in, in, in 1976, which of course was a year after her death, and it was talking very interestingly about, in fact, um, the relevance of the bias card that came back in the 70s, because obviously in the 60s um, it was very, um, let's, let's say, square orientated. There were these minis, and everything was. Um, not in bias, and the, the 70s brought back the 30s lengths and, and also the drapery and uh, um, body consciousness, let's say, and, and that really put Vionnet back on the map mm. after, after quite uh, a few decades, let's say. Of, but of you mentioned something that was really interesting is fabrics. It all starts with the textile, and there has been so much innovation in the textile industry um, worldwide that the fact that you've been really looking into new textiles is, is something very important because that will shape what comes out, what kind of silhouette you get at, in the end. No, no, absolutely. The textiles also, at the beginning of the 20th century, of course, there was industrial revolution and the, and the mass production just came about. And, and um, I think also the textiles I was reading, again, please cut me off, because it might have been a <laughs> wrong source. But um, I've been reading that um, there is a piece dyeing um, technique that appeared, which allowed to fix that the, the bias yarn, and um, that allowed for a more stretchy material. So in fact, stretch materials are also, in a way, um, uh, an invention or so of, of Vionnet. So I'm curious, what bias. is what is your process, how do you approach the collection considering, um, because you don't have a, a traditional fashion background, you, you didn't, you didn't, um, oh, I did do a little bit of training throughout, but yes, but, absolutely. But, but is your, is your approach, do you, do you draw, do you come with an idea and ask for someone to elaborate on it, do you, do you clip things, do you come from with historical references, how do you, how do you approach each you collection? Oh, you should see me in the office because, um, a my stylist, Dervish. my stylist, who I, <laughs> I love very much, and, and she came to me, she said, Gogo, but why are you not wearing heels? Because, you know, I always see you, and you're always wearing flats, and before you always, you know, you, you just kind of, have, you, you need to wear heels, it's about posture, it's about, I'm like, listen, I really love to wear heels, but I think I would fall, because I, I do everything with everybody in, in my team, and I draw, and I 
work with the party make it my love and then with and and with every department pretty much and I'm on the floor and, and then I'm jumping up but and do you down start, the beginning what's the starting point what's the beginning the beginning always comes um with with an idea inspiration i mean we always when when starting a collection i always look through the books one of them tell of us, course no but tell us about this collection that we're actually seeing because it has a nice story okay well the first of course we take a book written by Pamela Goldbin, <laughs> <laughs> and start looking through it. Um, it's a beautiful book, by the way. And um, then, of course, I try to find inspiration and ideas anywhere but fashion after that, quite frankly. Uh, in this collection, for instance, um, I was fascinated with the color of iridescence. So, um, and it started with me looking at uh, patterns created by um, oil when hitting the ocean during famous spills that are happening and the environmental um, disasters that are happening. And, and of course, they are disasters. However, when you look at it from an aesthetic point of view, it is actually quite beautiful. And um, I, I started studying the color of iridescence First, looking at the the so-called man-made yet unpredictable result that happens in nature, and then wanted to look where else can you find this iridescence in nature without any involvement of the man, and I found it in the dragonfly wings. So then, looking at the dragonfly wings, I looked at the patterns that the veins are making, and somehow it clicked with me that in a way, it had a correlation with the Art Deco patterns that Madeleine Vionnet was, of course, very much interested in and worked very much with Ernesto Tayat and uh, this, this imagery that, that came to my mind. And um, with my team, then we started looking at these iridescence, uh, at these patterns, um, working back and forth, looking at different materials. And um, then I was very fascinated with the unpredictable result that that is achieved by almost a whiplash effect of a, of a man putting um, his forceful nature, let's say, onto um, something natural. It's very difficult to explain. I, it is very clear in my head, my dear. Um, and I started looking at the same time um, at the abstract movement, art movement, uh, Pollock in particular, who, like the oil spill, was taken his um, paint and was throwing it at the canvas. So it was him kind of forcing himself onto this canvas, yet what the result was unexpected and beautiful, and it had to do with the, with the way that this paint was landing and, and in a way um, having a relationship with the, with the canvas that was almost didn't have anything to do with him. So you will see it's stuck onto one. Um, image now. This is, of course, uh, one of the veins that you see, which is a which is a, a, a reversible dress, and you'll see it in the next slide. Where, again, we took the shapes are always to do with Viennet, and it's a spiral. So it's a one piece of fabric that is literally like peeling an apple. is 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 cut around the body. So we're always being very body conscious, and the shapes you'll see are very true to Viennet. Even this. So this is a motif uh, taken from Fontana, actually, another abstract artist, and then uh, putting an element. I'm talking about decorative, of course, now. But this element at the bottom is the Greca, the, uh, used very, very much by Madeleine Vionnet. So we always have a little reference to the past. Yet trying to be the future, this textile took me, I don't know, about three months to, to achieve, because it's three different techniques in one. It's a devore, a fil coupé, and a pigment print. I mean. Actually, um, we were working with Hussein, I don't know if he's in the auditorium, started um, on this fabric for the, um, for the couture, it didn't work out then, but we took it further and further and then elaborated into, into this eventually. So um, it was, it, it's selling right now actually in the, in the showrooms. You just came in well. from New York, I think. Yes, presenting. We just presented in New York and got really good reviews and, and a very is, good. Is this the dragonfly wing you were mentioning? Yes, I'm. You know, I'm. <laughs> I'm very lucky like this. I can borrow pieces from the showroom, <laughs> although my commercial team always mind. They always say, "Koga, no, don't take it because that means it's not going to be in the showroom." 
So yes, it is one of them. But it's, it will be in the stores next year, of course. We're all working ahead. Anyways, uh, please. I know your passion for Vyoni, but a question that always arises is, why not have started your own brand? Um, I was never about me. My, 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 my love for fashion was always fascination. I don't know, it, also Vionnet. Somehow people ask me, and, and you mentioned, why would you be interested in Vionnet? Why would you choose Vionnet? People ask me this question, um, interviewers and so on. And I always reply that I don't feel like I have chosen Vionnet. I feel like Vionnet had chosen me. I feel blessed to be able to, to, to work with a heritage like this. I have many ideas of my own, but I'm not, uh, I don't know, I don't, I'm not vain like that. It's not about, my, my passion for, for what I'm doing has nothing to do with being passionate about promoting myself. It's to be passionate about the processes. In fact, I'm, I, I much more enjoy a day without you know, appearing in public and <laughs> being with my team that I, as I said, already mentioned, uh, love very dearly and enjoy every minute with and and for me th these processes the creative processes we go through the travel that we go to that the, also I take my team and we travel we take I take them on inspiration trips we just went to Berlin a couple of weeks ago we went to Tokyo before where we always kind of keep an open mind and talk about VNA and talk about new inspirations and new um, interesting ways of draping working on the fabric doing this and, and it's just a this is what I love the most, and and I feel like I was meant to be somehow doing exactly this, and not creating some Gogash Kanazi brand. It's just not me, really. <laughs> well, should we open up to uh, questions from the audience? I'm sure people want to participate. Sure. I can't really see with the light, so. No. Is there a microphone we could pass around? Hi. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thanks for a fascinating discussion. It's always great to learn about someone that you knew nothing about. Um, and I was wondering if um, Madame Vianney's closing of her house in 1939 had anything to do with the occupation of Paris um, uh, and like you know world events I also wondered uh, that dress the square dress is so beautiful and um, it reminded me of Valievich his um, suprematist squares and <clears throat> I was wondering if she and also the um, circle square and triangles like Cezanne brought to life and I was wondering if she was connected with any of, of that or mm -hmm. if she was aware of she was doing. Ab absolutely. Um, she did close in 1939 because of the war, and she was not the only house in Paris that closed down. However, she was um, one of the houses that didn't reopen after the war. Things changed quite drastically in fashion, and what's important to know is that she was already in her 60s by then and had started at the age of 11. So over 50 years had gone by, and she was ready to retire. And in 1939, 65 was, you know, a, a good age. But she did live for almost 40 more years. And yes, she was close to that movement, to Malevich and all of the purists, Le Corbusier. She wasn't um, like Chanel, who went out and was very much about herself. She, she stayed uh, very much out of the limelight, but was very close to artists and designers of her time. Anyone else? Down here. Uh, as I read, uh, you were in uh, oil business in the past. So uh, where is this interest in uh, fashion coming from? And what we have to wait uh, of the future of Vienna brand? What will uh, it change? You will uh, change the DNA of this brand, or it will stay the same? Thank you. Um, I was in oil and gas and also mining business, and but that was more means to an end. I was, I suppose, it wasn't. 
I, I, I wasn't growing up thinking, my God, I really want to be in oil and gas. <laughs> <laughs> I was growing up sort of more really interested in, in fashion, and, and my mother was making all of her... Uh, all of her clothes and an atelier and, and all of my uniforms, and she was obsessed. I guess I, I kind of in, inherited this, this love for fashion. But when an opportunity arises, and I was kind of fortunate, and I, I do consider myself very lucky to be able to have um, faced those opportunities, when an opportunity arises, and it's the, it's, it's the logic that says you can't, whether you are going to be passionate about this particular, you know, opportunity it's just something you can't pass it's just it would be silly not to do it and then of course there is a whirlwind that just takes you in and you do one and then the other and then it's always dragging you and you know you, you try to get out but they drag you back in they it's always um it, it always feels good to make money in a way you know it's it's a very it's a it's a feeling when you are financially successful and you're becoming secure and that gives you a level of independence that is almost addictive, this independence. Um, and certainly I wouldn't have been able to be doing, sitting here and doing what I'm doing without, without that part of my life. Yet I always knew it was temporary and I always wanted to be in fashion. And when I, it was literally a conscious decision when I moved in fact to Florence and to do with the previous question, um, Madeleine Vionnet was collaborating very closely with an artist called uh, Ernesto Tayat from Florence. Um, and, they, and they created very beautiful illustrations and, and um, worked together. Um, and so it just somehow clicked. Anyway, I was doing these courses in fashion and in arts and for a year rebooting my system and looking for a brand. And when I heard Vionnet was was looking for a partner, I, was, I grabbed that opportunity. That was not an opportunity that I could pass either because that was a dream come true. And it's a very different feeling when you know that this is an opportunity that you were waiting your entire life for. This is, so I was very clear about that. Um, and uh, with Vionnet, when I, when I overtook Vionnet, it wasn't my ambition to, to become creative director immediately. I wanted to leave myself time. For me, this is a lifelong project. It's not something I would move on. People ask me, if you were in another industry before and then you moved to fashion and then maybe you'll move again. I don't think it's going to be happening. And also another question is always, why do you think Vionnet is going to be successful this time around? People have tried before and I say always that it's either going to happen, or I'm either going to do it or I'm going to die trying because this is for me a lifelong dream. And um, so when I overtook it, I. I will always keep the DNA of the brand, but I guess an interpretation is um, I will probably be persecuted. Maybe some people will agree with me also in the future with, with the approach that I'm taking, but I'm doing my very best to preserve the legacy, but also be true to who Vionnet, Madeleine, Madame Vionnet was, and she was a revolutionary in a way. So. Not in a way, in a huge way. And, and, and so that spirit is also, for me, something to consider and keep true to. So the DNA will always be there in terms of form. And, and, but we move on, in a way, with, the, with all the new capabilities, like I was saying before. So hopefully we'll be able, with my team, to take it slightly forward as well and, and, and be worthy of, of the name and put the Vionnet name back on the pedestal where it belongs really so there's a lot of effort going toward that not only on the design front also also on the business side um we're we're opening stores all over and we're already in 250 locations around the world so it's growing it's getting there it just requires time and and support you know so your support counts for sure anyone else I'd just like oh. to add, because this is something that we speak of often, Goga's passion, um, relentless passion, but it's also a challenging industry. And I think there's some stu fashion students here. I think it would be nice if they hear your daily challenges, <laughs> <Maybe> <laughs> or not. at least a couple. <laughs> well, the fact that it never ends. So yes, it's well, it's never ending, for sure. I've, it sounds so little 
that I've been in it for two years. But I feel like I've been in it for I don't know how many years. What did you say? Dog years. Dog years. I said it's like seven years for one, because you do so many collections in one in one year, and every collection is a little lifetime almost, and it ends and it has a beginning and it's got a climax and it's got everything. So you live through these ups and downs, and at the same time. Apart from being creative, you have to face a lot of, I wanted to say a bad word, but a lot of unnecessary <laughs> challenges. A lot of challenges, a lot of unnecessary energy being wasted, let's say, on, on things that shouldn't matter. And um, there's also systems which I uh, have a very strong opinion about, but won't go into that conversation. There's a lot of... Um, there is a lot of tension, let's say, and not enough collaboration. In the arts world today, I find people are more collaborative, and historically it hasn't been like this. And in, in fashion, there is a lot of just tensions that uh, people are very mm, egoistical, let's say, and very egocentric. A lot of the time when the talent is here and the ego is about the same. It's 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 wonderful. If ego is here, talent is there. It really is unbearable, and there's <laughs> some of that too. So you know, it's it, it, a lot of that happens, and and unfortunately, some egos are nurtured, even though, the, the, you know, the, the, in my opinion, sometimes others maybe deserve it more. But anyway, it's it's a challenging industry for sure. You can only go in if if you are obsessed with the process, because all the rest of the um, dealings are, are very difficult. I know, I think a lot of people th uh, see the image of the designer coming at the end of the show and taking the bow and think it's very glamorous, but they don't oh realize God, that. Oh God, this is like 20 seconds of, um, <laughs> exactly. of like a months and months of beautiful, beautiful, pro as I was saying, beautiful moments, but also a lot of time of just wasted <laughs> for me. So yeah, it's definitely, it, it's, you know, I love it. So I can't discourage people. I love every minute. So I, I definitely think that if, if you feel this is, if, if anyone feels that this is, this is their path and, and uh, sky's the limit. And, and if, if you will persevere, I think, you know, you nurture your talent and, and, and you set your height and, and, you, and you will get there. I think that's a very good place to end. <laughs> thank you both very much and thank you as well. Thank you.